Okay, so here we are again at, at Malakal Bike Shop. And this is Sam, who's a dyno operator and TT racer as well, I think. Yeah. Um, and we're here today just to go through the process, step by step, of having a bike dynoed and what it involves for those folks who have never had a bike run before. So over to you, Sam. Um, we've got a bike there at the moment, sat on the dyno. And it's got various leads yeah. and pipes. So I'll just go so, through it. So yeah. if you've never been uh, on a dyno before, you're not quite sure what to expect. You're thinking about getting it done yourself. Yeah. Uh, we've got an old Yami R1 here on yep. carburetors. It's in because it wasn't running great. You know, at the top end it was nice, it's smooth, but at the bottom end it's hesitate. It's a bit lumpy, it's a bit rough, and that's mm -hmm. really one of the, the key reasons for getting your bike on the dyno. Yep. Another couple of horsepower at the top, a bit irrelevant. What you're interested in is a good smooth running bike that you can enjoy riding. Yeah. So this is a dyno we've got here at Hamilton's Honest Performance. It's a Dynajet 250i, which is a, a top spec dyno really. Yep. There's a few different manufacturers of dyno you can get. They all give slightly different readings, so one gives a slightly higher results, so one gives a slightly lower results. Yep. At the end of the day, the dyno doesn't like, the bike makes what power it makes. The Dynajet 250i is a great model to have because it's, yep. it's pretty much a standard one that's used to have racing and most dyno sensors. Mm -hmm. So you can go from one sensor to another if you want, you can compare. Otherwise, you don't know what you're comparing against yeah. a different yeah. dyno, a different day. Mm -hmm. So we strapped the bike onto it. It's strapped in at the front. It's strapped in at the back. You know, that's not going anywhere at all. It's yeah. nice and solidly yeah. mounted. The nice. bike sits with the front wheel stable, and the back wheel sits on a drum there. The big heavy and drum. They, yeah. yeah, and the idea is that the bike spins the drum around. The computer knows how much effort it takes to turn the drum, and it calculates that into a torque and therefore a power figure. Yeah. So we know what the bike's producing. And it also needs to know the revs of the engine. It does, it needs to know the revs of the engine. Unfortunately, this pickup is on the other side. Yeah. So people think it's turn for a dyno and just pop it on and go. It's not quite so simple. So for this bike, with it having uh, separate coils, high tension leads, we have to take the tank up, the airbox off, to get to the coil so that I can take a pickup. Uh, unfortunately, that's on the other side, so we can't see that uh, now. See. So there's quite a lot of preparation time. Well, so if you had a Harley, it'd be so easy. But anyway. Yeah, it is, yeah. Something like a, a big twin, like that KTM. Or a Bandit, maybe. Just had yeah. On. yeah, just Bandit. clip onto one of the coils yeah. at the back, no problem. Okay. The next thing we need, of course, is a reading for the air fuel, because what this is all about, realistically, is getting a problem source with the fuel ratio. Yeah. So we've got a probe that goes into the back here, and that's a, a big, long pipe that goes all the way down into the bottom of the exhaust there. There's a pump which runs air through it, and it sucks the air through past the lambda sensor, like you'd have the standard lambda sensor in your car or a modern bike. Yeah. And that's it down here, and again, the computer takes the reading. Uh, like I say, pumps air through, we get a good reading of the air fuel. We've got, a, got the revs as well. We've got the wheel speed, so, you know, we it know more about what the bike's doing than everything. the bike knows. And what you're trying to do is to, if you're going to tune it, is to get that air fuel ratio spot on all the way through the red range, is that right? Yeah, exactly. But with a carb bike, you know, carbs are a bit imprecise, it's old technology, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, we try and get it as smooth as possible all the way through the rev range, and particularly with a, a Power Commander Dynajet kit or any of the remapping software that we use here, we're looking for the fuel ratio to be absolutely perfect every way through the, the rev okay. range, okay. which it never is. No, generally no. standard. No, and modern bikes tend to be very weak, don't they, during the mid-range due to emissions and whatnot. Exactly, modern bikes are the biggest uh, issue. The biggest problems we have for remaps here, realistically, are things like modern BMWs and Kawasaki's. Great bikes, but to meet, meet all this, you know, modern Euro 4 emissions regulations, they're very lean, they're very snatchy, and it doesn't give a smooth ride, your pillions yeah. complain. So get rid of the big old clunky exhaust system and the catalytic converters, get the fuel in right, and it feels smooth, like a, yeah. a good old yeah. car bike. A lot more mid-range as well. Yeah, much improved mid-range. You, know, you could be looking at 20 volts more through the mid-range, even if you're only looking at five more at the top, yeah. because they do run so lean and standard. And that's for fuel economy as much as anything else. But what people miss is that when your bike's running more efficiently, you know, you're not using so much throttle, so therefore yeah. your fuel economy picks up yeah. anyway. Or it can be in a higher gear. Exactly, yeah. You get away okay, with anything once you get a smoother bike. But this old bike here, well, this oldish bike is carved. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's on here now just for a quick run to see what's going on. And then you're going to fix it and tune it a little bit. And what we'll do now is um, I'll leave you to do a power run. We'll leave the camera on. And at the end, we'll come back and review what the results are on the printouts. Yeah, okay. okay, we'll just fill you in quickly what this bike's in for. Like I say, it's snatchy at the bottom end, yeah. so it's had the carbs ultrasonic clear. You know, base runs first so we know what's going on. Yeah. We'll have the carbs in the ultrasonic bath, and then we run it again, see what needs doing, put the Dynajet uh, kit in, right. run in it again just to get it spot on. And now with the stage where the kit's in, everything's clean, it's ready to go for another run. Brilliant. And generally it take three or four of these runs, the whole process, the whole setting up, to get it right again. Right. Okay. If I just turn the camera now up to the screen and the computer there, 
I can see there's some nice clever dials and things. So what, yes, what's so happening there? I'll just pop up a bit. Yeah. Yep. So what we're looking at here is an air fuel reading. Of course, we've got nothing at the moment because it's yep. not switched on. Um, we've got an engine speed which relates to the pickup. We've got braking, so we can apply a braking force to the dyno oh, bolt, okay. which can simulate actually riding it on the road. Mm -hmm. At the moment, there's no load on the drum. There's very little load on the drum, mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually much easier on the bike yeah. riding here on the drum rather than riding on the road against wind resistance things like that. So, it's, so uh, you won't destroy your tyre or anything like that. No, it didn't destroy your tyre. That's a nice little dyno myth that you yeah. come back and your tyre will have flung off into pieces. No, it doesn't Unless you're running a, a racing wet tyre or something like that, we won't run those yeah. on the dyno. Yeah. Um, or a super soft drag racing tyre, they yeah. tend to fling apart. So if you ever do a road tyre, so if cool. you ever do a track day bike, or a race bike, I believe you can change the tyre temporarily to an old yeah. second hand one and then bang that on. We do, yeah. We've got a Honda Fireblade here, track and race bike. It's got, I don't know if you can see that down yeah, here, it's got yeah. the slip tyres on, on it. it. Yeah. Now these ones, we looked at the compound, the compound's absolutely fine to run on the dyno. Yeah. If it was a super soft qualifying tyre, which we yeah. sometimes get those in, yeah. we just put it on one of our dyno tyres and run that. Right, right. okay. Okay, great. So, time for more tea, and then I'll leave you to. Yeah, the uh, most important bit. Of yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To do the run. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cheers. Okay, so we're ready now. The bike's gone through its warm-up procedure. We get it right up to temperature, let it cool down, and heat up, just like you would if you were going to have a, a racing bike on track. Checked all the fluid levels are all right. The, we know this bike's good because we've had on a few times now. We've got the extractor system set up so that it poisons itself while I'm in this closed room. And we've got a massive fan there that simulates riding around 90 yeah. miles an hour. It's all that keeps the bike temperature completely under control, which you can watch here as well. Um, so we're ready to run. Now we're yep. up to temperature, so I'll just get, a, get the bike revving and uh, let's see how she is. Okay.
now, done a good selection through the throttle, uh, through the different gears and everything, feeling what the bike's doing. Uh, AC, the bike gives a slightly different power reading every run as the oil gets up to perfect temperature. So what we look for is good few consistent runs around the same power figure. We've got our power here, our torque, or oh, a lot of different ones as you can see, so there's a lot of different lines. Yep. We'll just pick our, one of some of our most consistent ones really for making car breath alterations. I've got an air fuel reading along the bottom here. Yeah. So we'll get a few printouts of that and I'll give it to the boys next door. We'll go through it and see what alterations we need to make. Pull it apart, put it back together and try it all again. Okay, so we've got a printout, which is at the end of the process really. It shows what we've done, what the bike was like before, and it shows what we've done and what we've got afterwards. This particular bike isn't the R1 earlier. This was off at Kawasaki we had in the other week. It was a lightweight TT bike, which raced this year's 2016 TT. Uh, started as a Kawasaki ER6 and has been heavily modified. As a result, it's difficult to get the fuel in right. And uh, it was in a mess before, as you can clearly see. The fuel line on the bottom here was running quite lean. The effect it's had on the bike, you can see here the before and after. So before is red and the blue is after. And you can clearly see how the bike is running, not smoothly. Not only is the power lower, but we've got big dips here. And as a result, the bike felt flat. It's, it's not smooth all the way through. The torque has increased throughout the rev range from having the fuel incorrect. Really, the big part here for racing is getting this top section here. Rather than being at the flat section there, which you can see isn't smooth, we've lifted the whole area there by bringing the fuel into where it should be. That's really what we're after, and I'm sure the bike rode a lot better as a result. Okay, that's great. So just to be clear then, that top curve is horsepower? Yeah, the top one, sorry, is horsepower. The bottom one there is the bike's torque, and at the bottom here we've got the air-fuel ratio, uh, which ideally is a dead straight line. It's not perfect, because the bikes are so customised. Mm -hmm. They're running more than 50% more power than standard. They've got different throttle bodies, bell mounts, injectors, airbox, everything. Uh -huh. But you know, that's, that's pretty damn So that's based there. on the ER6 Kawasaki? It was originally an ER6 Kawasaki. And how Kawasaki. much power is that making now? Cause that's making now 91.8 horsepower, which is all right considering it's on a, a sticky track tyre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the highest in the class would be high 90s. Uh, but as standard, they run around 60 horsepower, I think. Okay. So with a power run then, that's what you'd see, that's what you'd be given. Uh, yeah, if you're going with a race bike, this is a good example of one because the difference is, is quite large. On a road bike, you'd be expecting something similar, yeah. you know, before and after with one weather curve was lifted all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people get bogged down in one horsepower more, two horsepower more. We had a bike in not long ago, a touring bike, and he only gained five horsepower at the top on a 140 horsepower bike. But the smoothness he gained through the bottom end is what really makes the difference. And you can see the difference here in the torque. But there's a huge difference there, yeah. another 10 foot pound maybe there which is going to give better throttle response, smoother run up through the revs, and make the bike feel better. Yeah. How much is actually gained is, you know, irrelevance. It's, it makes the bike ride better, and that's why we all ride bikes, because we love riding bikes. We want them to be the best they can be. Yeah, OK. So I think we should end it there. We've covered, I think, every part of the process. And thanks for that, and thanks for your time, Sam. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. Will do. Cheers.